Welcome to this next video in which we are discussing internal and external direct products. Okay, so in the previous video we discussed what in is meant by an internal and an external direct product. We discussed that an internal direct product is just a subgroup product in a special case, and an external direct product is just a direct product in a special case. Okay, and this special case is where you've got two normal subgroups inside a group capital G where their intersection is equal to the trivial subgroup. In that case, um, the subgroup product of these two normal subgroups with trivial intersection is called the internal direct product of those two subgroups, and the direct product of those two uh, subgroups, which are normal inside of G with trivial intersection, uh, is called the external direct product. And we end it with this statement, which we now want to prove, which is that the internal direct product is isomorphic to the external direct product, hence why we now call the subgroup product the internal direct product, because of the fact that it is giving the same algebraic structure as the initial direct product, and then to uh, show um, or illustrate or exaggerate the two different ways that we came to get the same algebraic structure, we call this one the internal way of doing it, and we call this one the external way of doing it. Okay, so, what we now want to do then is we want to understand why this is true. So to understand why this is true, we need to gain more insight into this one. This is the more difficult one, the subgroup product of the two. This one is extremely easy. This is just component-wise composition, very, very simple to understand. We need to gain more understanding about this one here. Okay, this is the more complicated one. And the first thing that I want to show you is that all the elements that you would put into here are um, distinct. There's no degeneracies. And let me say, let me show you what I mean by that, because it's quite difficult to find the words really to describe what I'm trying to say here. Okay, so this subgroup product of the two, the definition is still the same. It's just all the elements in capital G of the form, an element of capital H, little h here, composed with an element of capital K, little k here. So little h is an element of capital H, and little k is an element of capital K. Okay, uh, so you take every possible composition that you can possibly come up with. You take every element of capital H and compose it with every possible element of capital K, get all of the answers, collect them together in a subset, and that's your subgroup product of capital H with capital K here. Okay, what I am now saying, the first point that I want you to understand, is that when you do this, all of the answers that you get are going to be distinct. Okay, so you're going to go through every element of capital H, and for each element of capital H, you're going to compose it with every element of capital K. I'm saying that all of those different possibilities that you're going to have to work out, they're all going to give different answers. No two different combinations of an element of capital H with an element of capital K are going to give the same element of capital G. That's what I mean by saying there are no degeneracies here. There are no uh, compositions that are putting in the same element into this subset and therefore aren't really adding in uh, a new element. Okay, all the answers here are distinct. Okay, right, so how can I uh, justify that then? Well, firstly, I hope it's obvious that no two uh, compositions of this form, uh, little h composed with little k, and little h composed with some different element of capital K can possibly be equal to one another. Okay, so I cannot use the same element of capital H and compose it with different elements of capital K and expect to get the same thing. The reason is, is that obviously if I did get the same thing, all I could do, uh, well what I could do is then compose with H's inverse on both sides and I'd then get the statement that K was equal to K bar, which is obviously also rubbish. Okay, if I'm assuming that they're distinct. Okay, so that is one possibility that we can rule out straight away. You cannot have two different uh, compositions in here 
giving the same element if they've got the same element of capital H, and of course the same argument holds if they've got the same element of capital K. So all we now need to check is that it's not possible to have two different compositions which involve both a different element of capital H and a different element of capital K uh, that equal one another. So what I want to prove is that little h uh, composed with little k cannot equal little h bar composed with little k bar, Okay, where we are assuming now that little h is not equal to little h bar and little k uh, bar is not equal to little k. I don't know why I've flipped the order in which I put that, but never mind. Uh, the meaning is there. Okay, right, so how do we prove that? Well, very simply, okay, all uh, we can do is we can do a proof by contradiction here. Suppose that these two were the same, okay, so suppose that h is not equal to h bar and k is not equal to k bar, but that when we perform these compositions, h composed with k and h bar composed with k bar, we get the same element of capital G. What would that then imply? So I've now got this equation, h, k is equal to h bar, k bar here. Okay, well now, of course, what I can do is I can compose with h bar's inverse on the left here, and what I'll get is h bar inverse, h, k, and then the h bar inverse will cancel with the h bar, so you'll just get then k bar. And now what you can do is compose on the right with k's inverse, and what you'll get is that h bar inverse composed with h is equal to k bar composed with k inverse. Now, why is that a problem? Why is this statement that I've managed to arrive at a contradiction? Well, look, h bar inverse is not going to be the inverse of h, so what you've got here is not going to be the identity element. Okay, so this is going to be an element of capital H that is not the identity element. The same is true here, k bar composed of k inverse, that's going to be an element of capital K, but it's not going to be the identity element. So look, I've got a non-identity element of capital H that is equal to a non-identity element of capital K. Why is that a problem? Well, I had the starting assumption that H intersect K was the trivial subgroup. Here I found some non-identity element that's in both of them. That would therefore be in their intersection, okay, contradicting the fact that their intersection is the trivial subgroup. Okay, so that, because of the fact that H intersect K is the trivial subgroup, there is the evidence for why, when I generate all of these compositions, no two different compositions, when I'm composing different elements of H and K together, can actually give me the same answer in G. So I must, when I'm doing this, get all distinct answers. So every single different composition is going to add something new to this subset. Okay, right. So that's the first point to um, put across here, that if I'm, uh, well, that's, this is the understanding of the elements of this, first of all. This says that every element can be represented uh, by an element little h composed with little k. That's nothing new, uh, but of course the new thing now is that each combination of an element of little h with an element of little k is a distinct element. It represents a distinct element in here. There's no degeneracies. There are no elements which can be represented by two different compositions of an element of capital H with an element of capital K. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to point out. Now, we've got an understanding of the elements in here. What I now want to look at is, can we understand the composition law on here? Okay, so we know this is going to end up as a subgroup of capital G. Let's understand the composition law on here. So what I want to do is, I want to take an element from here, and an element from here looks like this, an element little h composed of an element little k. Let's take another element which looks like this, little h bar composed with little k bar. So I've just taken two elements here. Let's compose them together. Of course, because this is a subgroup, I'll get something back in here. I know from here uh, that every element in here can be understood as something in capital H composed with something in capital K. Well, I know that really from the absolute definition here. What this showed is that they're all distinct. Um, so, can I write this now? Can I work out which, um, e which element of capital H I need to have in the front and which element of capital K I need in the front? I know that this must be something of that form. How do I actually work it out is the question now that I'd like to address. Okay, so how can I take this and actually get what the answer is in terms of my understanding of the elements of this subgroup here? Okay, right. Well, to understand this, what 
I want to actually show you is that elements of capital H are going to commute with capital K. So uh, put this to one side, and now let's have a little sort of intermediate bit. So here comes the claim. Okay, the important claim here is that if you've got little h composed with little k, okay, it's actually true that this is the same as little k composed with little h. And now we can use this really easily here because I can just flip k and h bar around there because elements of capital H commute with elements of capital K. And then this will become, of course, h composed with h bar uh, and then k composed with k bar. So this will just become work out what h composed with h bar is and put that as your element uh, little h here or the element of capital H that's in the front and then work out what k composed with k bar is. Uh, that's an element of capital K and that's your element of capital K in the back here. Okay, so you can see that composition is extremely simple if this is going to be true. Okay, so why is this true? Why do elements of capital H commute with elements of capital K? Well, this is because both of them are normal subgroups of capital G. Okay, so let's start off on the left hand side here and arrive at the right hand side. So what I can do is I can say h composed with k, that's equal to h composed with k, composed with h inverse, composed with h. Okay, it's one of these fancy tricks where you stick in something that doesn't actually change the expression but helps you along, okay? Okay, so now of course what I've got here is h k h inverse, that's little k conjugated by little h. I can now apply the fact that capital K is a normal subgroup in G to say that this is going to be some other element of capital K. Let's call it little k bar. Okay, so now I've concluded that little h composed of little k is equal to some little k bar composed with little h. Of course, what I want to now show is that little k bar has to equal little k. Okay, how can I do that? Well, I apply the same trick again. What I can do now is put k bar inverse k bar here. Okay, this will be truly equal to this. You can absolutely do this. This is absolutely fine for you to do. Okay, you can't stop me doing this. It might not occur to you to do this, but you can't stop me doing this. Okay, and now look at this thing. I've got little h composed with some element of capital K. Li capital H is a normal subgroup inside of G, so any element conjugating little h is just going to give me some little h bar. So look what I've got here. I've got now that little h composed with little k is equal to some little h bar composed with some little k bar. Now go back to theorem 1. Is this possible? Okay, well the only way it's possible if, is if little h bar and little k bar are equal to little h and little k respectively. Okay, otherwise this composition will be different from this one. It will give you a different element of g. So this implies that little h bar is equal to little h and little k bar is equal to little k. And hence I can conclude back here that little k bar was equal to k. Okay, so indeed h composed with k is uh, k composed with H. So indeed, elements of capital H do commute with elements of capital K. So now, of course, what you can just do, as I said earlier, is flip these two round, commute K with H bar, and you'll get that this is now H composed with H bar, composed with K, composed with K bar. Okay, so if you have these two elements and you want to work out what element in here is actually the answer. Just compose the elements from capital H that are out the front of the elements together. You'll get something in capital H. That's what you'll put in your first slot. Compose the elements from capital K that are in the second positions together. You'll get something from capital K. Put that in your second slot. And there, you're done. Okay, right. So now to bring this all together, to actually find you the isomorphism between uh, the internal direct product and the external direct product is extremely simple. Hopefully, from your understanding of the external direct product, the true direct product, if you like, you should be able to see that this is obviously going to be isomorphic to it, because look, this is just component-wise composition as well. We've just got different um, names for the uh, elements of the group. Okay, so now let's actually make the isomorphism explicit. So, as always, we'll call our isomorphism uh, phi here. Okay, so it's going to be a mapping from the internal direct product of the two subgroups to the external direct product H cross K here. And what is it specifically going to do? Well, of course, it's going to carry an element, little h, little k, which we know are all distinct elements in here, to the distinct element over here, which is the ordered pair, little h, little k. So extremely intuitive map. Okay. 
And what we're actually going to show is that this is an isomorphism. So that's first the argue as to why it's a bijective map. Well, this comes back down to that first point that I showed you, that all of the different compositions in here are distinct elements. Okay, so they will all be distinct elements and they can therefore all be mapped onto the distinct elements over here. Okay, all of these ordered pairs are distinct here for every different um, combination of an element from capital H and an element from capital K, all of these ordered pairs are distinct. So you're going from a distinct element here to a distinct element here. Okay, so this is perfectly nicely well defined and indeed hopefully you can appreciate that that will be injective and subjective, therefore it will be bijective. So all that remains to be seen is that the composition is compatible, which hopefully from uh, what I've already shown you should be obvious to you, but I will just formalize it. Okay, so what we want to show is that phi of two elements from here composed together, so hk composed with h bar k bar is equal to phi of hk composed over here with phi of h bar k bar. Okay, well let's do this. So we know how to work this thing out here. That's what we've just shown. Okay, we've shown that h composed with k composed with h bar composed with k bar will equal h composed with h bar composed with k composed with k bar, like so. Okay, so this just becomes phi of this, but of course this is just an element of capital H and this is just an element of capital K. Okay, so by applying the definition of uh, how phi works, it's going to, whoops, it's going, which ordered pair is it going to map this onto? Of course, it's going to map it onto the ordered pair H composed with H bar, K composed with K bar, like so. Okay, so this is the left-hand side developed. Now let's develop the right-hand side. Well, phi of HK, just by definition, will be the ordered pair HK, phi of h bar k bar will be the ordered pair h bar k bar. Okay, and of course, applying the definition of composition in the direct product shows us that indeed it will be this, uh, where we are uh, just using composition in the uh, group capital G, because of course these compositions in the middle here, these will just be compositions according to the uh, group capital G, which both of the subgroups were contained in. Okay, so indeed, uh, this uh, proves that the isomorphism, uh, well, the, it proves the compatibility of the composition laws between the two. So indeed, these two different approaches to forming this product are giving the identical algebraic structure. Yes, we've got different symbols. Yes, this is a different symbol from this. Okay, you haven't got the brackets or the comma. Oh, again, indeed, who knows what the symbol for the actual composition of little h with little k could be in the group capital G. Okay, so yes, we've got very different symbols between the two, but symbols do not matter. They are man-made. They are not the core algebraic structure. Algebra group theory is about studying the core algebraic structure, not the symbols that we are using to denote the elements of the uh, group. Okay, so truly these two are the same algebraic structure. Okay, and that's um, why we have called the subgroup product, in this case, the internal direct product, to show its parallels with uh, the direct product. And we call it the internal direct product simply because of this different strategy to create the same algebraic structure at the end. And then we call the true direct product, the external direct product, to, again, uh, note the, or exaggerate the different strategy by which we actually produce the end product. But they do, in this special case, result in the exact same structure. Okay, hence why they are given these new names to make them uh, sound similar. Okay, and with that we will end this video on the internal and external direct products.